Sam Lysenko, you're an Emmy nominee for uh, production design for a narrative program half hour for your work on The Bear. Uh, now, specifically, you're nominated for the first episode of the series, System. Uh, what were some of the initial ideas you had for this setting, this, this kind of kitchen workplace setting when you first read the script? Um, the, the creator and showrunner is a, a very, very dear friend of mine who had been sort of playing around with the idea of doing this uh, initially as a feature film for many, many years. And so there was always this conception that a sensitivity to the realism of the kitchen environment as a workplace was was uh, paramount, um, so much so that um, part of the ethos was that we we needed to be able to set up the production with a methodology to allow the actors to actually be, practically be cooking uh, and and create a space in which our biggest production fear was actually like actors cutting fingers off. Uh, the the extreme attention to the fluidity of actually preparing food on camera while delivering dialogue was was always sort of our our ethos. And then we um, we discussed uh, movies that were inspirational to us in particular, especially when this was still a feature. That um, there was a layer of uh, an, a practical approach to production that facilitated something that felt very, very real, uh, be it, you know, American movies of the late 70s or specifically Chicago comedies of the 80s, a lot of the John Hughes stuff in which um, space, as, space as a character was uh, secondary to the reality of the environment, um, which also opened us up to exploring real kitchens um, and real spaces that we could potentially shrink down into a functional space that felt like it could fit uh, in in the footprint of this this fictional restaurant. So it was really always allowing the space to bump up against camera and not not create a space that worked best for television uh, was was the guiding light, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, um, and and yeah, how do you find that balance where you're creating this? physical layout uh you know that's so con that contributes so much to the story and to the tension of the show uh but you're also kind of accommodating you know actors production crew and you know, you know how do you how do you find that balance it was it was a lot more akin to anything i would have associated with like uh, a choreographed dance numbers for film in which you're you're coming up with a, a footprint of uh, of actor motion and blocking well ahead of time that is disassociated from the location and then trying to make the practical space um, functional for that outlined footprint. So that, that really just meant reconfiguring elements of practical kitchen spaces to make them work for us based on, oh, well, we need this actor to pass this actor at this point and call corner and brush up against them. Um, so uh, step one was really like, we started looking at, uh, for the purposes of the pilot, we, we were looking at college campuses that had teaching kitchens that were exponentially larger than our needs, so that we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to sacrifice the the practical hookups of gas and water and things like that, uh, and then make that work for us. We settled on a defunct restaurant that had an oversized kitchen space that we were able to then shrink down, and then when it got when it went to series, that was recreated on stage uh, by the very talented permanent art crew. Uh, and it seems like set decoration is especially important on a show like this, where you're creating this working kitchen, um, you know, with a lot of equipment. There's a lot of history attached with uh, with the family uh, involved. Uh, what was that collaboration like with uh, your set decorator, Emily Carter? Yeah, it was it was it was a much more fluid relationship, I would say, between set decoration and props than than I would normally gauge in a project like this. So there was a sensibility of. Know, implied practicality that I outlined in the approach to the normal discourse of designer and decorator, but it was more about like applying um, applying sentimentality and implied history to objects that exist in the space because they're also simultaneously functional. So you're talking about uh, you know be it a wall of spice or their their prep knives or the butcher block that has been there forever, and and reaching a point of fluidity between decoration and props that. Um, in which actors feel comfortable interacting with with decoration in a way that they probably wouldn't normally on other shows in, in the same capacity. 
Uh, and you've worked on, uh, you know, really tense kinetic uh, stories before, uh, like the films of the Safdie brothers, uh, which are like anxiety, the movie, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, did those particular projects, uh, you know, kind of prepare you for working on this one and, and the demands of it and, and the sort of style and, and tone of it? Um, I think in, I'm hesitant to say that there's, uh, because there's a, an aesthetic parallel in the language of freneticism between how characters in the bear and, and some of the work that I've done with the Safdies, uh, uh, corresponds. I, I'm hesitant to say that there's aesthetic similarities beyond the fact that they just have the same designer, but, um, in terms of in terms of your approach towards how you as a, as a production person deals with the stress of the unknown, you know, the, there's always a possibility that a director may say, hey, can you, can you get us a live giraffe after lunch? And I think that um, what you try to do is you try to maintain a level of um, creative integrity and discourse with the, with the team and not let that shit get to you. So it's like, well, no, I can't get you a giraffe that's ludicrous but i can call a guy and get a cheetah you know I, I think being able to navigate um navigate that creative language for the betterment of the fiction and make sure everybody's on the same page and not get stressed out by it allows you to critically gauge whether or not you want to create an environment that appears stressful and i think that 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 is something that um, previous experiences like, sort of prepared me for emotionally, because otherwise you just lose your fucking mind. <laughs> um, and you know, one of the uh, interesting things about uh, uh, the Emmys uh, with your nomination is a lot of times we see awards attention for production design go to you know uh, fantasy or period projects, but the Emmys. Uh, recognize such a wide range of production design across categories and genres and styles. And uh, wh what do you think about this kind of specific realistic contemporary world building, uh, getting a chance to be recognized by your peers for it? Uh, it's, it's quite a compliment. Um, my parents are thrilled. Uh, but I think it's, it's a double-edged sword because I, for me, um, despite uh, some of the more realistic things that I've done in my career, I think that no matter what you're doing as a designer, um, be it, you know, broad fiction or period or, or sci-fi, whatever it wants to be, um, to a certain extent, you're making choices that, um, that will reiterate and solidify the audience's experience with that narrative fiction. And so if you're thinking about how good something looks, uh, to a certain extent, it's antithetical to being lost in the fiction of the thing. Um, and so I think that sometimes it's easiest to recognize good design uh, because it is so different from your day-to-day -day experience with how the world looks. Uh, that being said, it's a, in, in this regard, it's a huge testament to the fiction uh, uh, and the performances and the cinematography and every other department that um, the, the transformative nature of that fictional story. These people are actors, it's not real, but if you believe it enough to care um, and you are lost in the world of this restaurant, it's, it's huge, it's high praise, but it shouldn't, it's not necessarily the goal for me to be lauded over the way something looks um, and instead to not be noticed, I think is the, is the highest praise. Um, and, and certainly that's uh, the case for contemporary, like you really want to create this immersive world that you're not really thinking about. Um, is, is that a different kind of approach than um, in, a, in a, you know, a period or, or fantasy project that you might be working on or, or is every project sort of that same kind yeah, of that, yeah. Yes and no. I mean, it, if, it, if the script says sh sh the, she sits at a desk and writes a letter, it takes the same amount of brain space as a designer or a decorator or a set dresser to place that pen as it does the desk itself. So the, as long as your, um, your level of consideration is there, as long as you, you really care about what you are creating um, in terms of imagery, I think you're still, to a certain extent, you're still controlling the entirety of the frame. Um, that being said, like, you know, if the bear took place in 1930, it would be a very different conversation in terms of uh, the level to which that world has to be built uh, with, with premeditation.
Uh, well, I want to congratulate you for your uh, nomination for The Bear um, and, and your work on the show. And thank you so thank much you. for talking with me about it. My pleasure. Thank you. Jessica Kender, you're nominated for uh, an Emmy for production design for a narrative period or fantasy program, one hour or more for your work on the limited series, Daisy Jones and the Six. Uh, this is your first Emmy nomination. Uh, so uh, what was your reaction to, to getting that recognition? Uh, well, I was outside gardening because I didn't want to get myself nervous and uh, heard my phone blowing up a bunch of times and it blew up enough that I was like, this probably isn't people just calling to say like, hey, too bad. Uh, and I happened to pick up the phone just as my producer was calling me. And I have to say I was shocked and I'm still in shock. It's such, um, it's such an honor to know that people like what you're doing and that people also who are from your peer group because that's who votes on us also think what you're doing is something of note you know it's the the biggest compliment you could possibly get uh and you're specifically nominated for the uh the finale episode of the series rock and roll suicide uh wondering what made you submit that episode uh in particular as an example of your work well, that episode, it, it was pretty easy because it did two things that were sort of perfect. One is that it has our concert, which is we literally built, you know, a concert stage in four days down in New Orleans, which was the one thing when I read the book and the script where I was like, am I going to do that? Like, how am I going to do that? Like, I don't know how to do that. So it had that stage, which had to get in there. And then second it has this massive amount of flashbacks that shows all the work we did for the whole series, which meant both of my decorators, Lisa and Andy, could get recognition as well. So it was sort of the perfect, like, it's the perfect show because it shows our biggest accomplishment just physically. And it also shows just the body of work we did. And let's be honest, it's a finale, so it's great. You know, just if you're having people watching for the first time, you want to show something that wows them, and this show wows. Uh, and and that uh, that uh, uh, Soldier Field concert that you create uh, is is very visually striking and and impressive, and uh, you feel the grandeur of it. Uh, you know, what what's the starting point of of figuring out how to how to create that, and and you know, you know were you researching Soldier Field and uh, like what went into that? Well, we started, obviously, I think all of design starts in research, you know, and we started looking, pulling concerts from the day to just see sort of what we would want to base off of. And I had a couple that I really loved, uh, you know, the wall of sound from back when, which was just speakers everywhere, you know, and as you start looking at, at different concerts, you realize there's a basic language in them. So we started picking that up and then it was the matter of, okay, we know what we want it to look like, but how are we actually going to do that? And how are we going to do it period? Um, so I both pulled from a friend of mine, Drew, who works in concert, travel with Jay-Z, you know, um, and he could sort of help me along for like, this is what things look like. And then my supervising art director, Brian was like, we are going to have to get someone in from the live world instead of what we do, who does this type of thing, who can help us figure out how we organize a four day install for this. Um, so there were a mix of that, you know, we ended up finding a company in Pennsylvania that still put up stages with the period scaffolding like they did back in the day, you know, so we had them come out to us. We, from a lighting standpoint, you know, I, because the lights were such an integral part of the set, I worked with lighting more than I typically would because it was going to be what we were going to see. And we, I think, got all of the period lighting from the U.S. like all over, like bought people out so that we could get it shipped to us, you know. And then there were fun parts about it where we are a TV show, you know, we're we're trying to make it look like real life, but there are other things about it that we need to address. So a lot of these stages had giant painted backings, but for us, so much of what happens in the story takes place backstage as well as front of stage. And I didn't want to have all our characters standing in front of just a plain white muslin backing. So Brian had brought up the idea of like, what if we use a scrim, which is a theatrical gimmick where you light it from the front, it's solid, light it from the back, you can see through, which meant when we are backstage, you could always get a hint of the front of stage that was happening. So it 
help build the tension. So there were a lot of fun things we did like that. Um, along with just shooting in a place uh, where we never actually had a lot of audience, you know, when you looked out in front of it. So that was like a fun thing when we went to, to New Orleans and I had to hand in to the city my plans. They wrote back and were like, you drew it wrong because the way they normally set up their their stages was the exact opposite of us. And I was like, no, no, we're creating that whole other part. This, this, I, I need it this way. So it was a lot of little things like that. And uh, what would you say was the uh, overall ratio of, of like builds for the show versus the locations and, and, and you know, using locations for, for different settings? Well, this show was definitely much more location-based than any other show I've done. Um, we didn't have what I would call a permanent set that we went back to. However, to say it was just location isn't totally accurate because everything that we did on location, we almost, I shouldn't say everything, about half of what we did, we would rebuild the inside anyway. So when you see Sound City, we came into that lobby and everything had been stripped away. You know, it's, it's glossy concrete floors, exposed rafters, that type of thing. So essentially we built our lobby set within the lobby. You know, and then when you're in the live rooms or the control rooms, when you're looking at the walls, they're all walls that we put up inside of their walls. There was a big discussion about where to spend the money. Should we build or should we shoot on location? And it was sort of agreed that coming to these locations, and even if we're essentially building a set within a set, the bones and the ghosts of the past that were there are going to give not only the actors, but the crew this added level of I don't know, this quality that you really can't, you can't put your finger on it, but it's there. You know Fleetwood Mac recorded albums here. You know, you know this board is where great music was composed. And so while we're in those spaces, that comes across in a way that you can't quantify. Uh, and the series uh, follows uh, its characters uh, from the late 60s through the 70s, uh, you know, how, did you approach that era and kind of, you know, did you, were you looking at like sort of subtle stylistic changes that are happening between like when we first meet them and, you know, as they're sort of the, at their last performance, their last time together? Well, what's actually amazing is because the late sixties and the seventies honestly is a beloved tap time. There is a ton of research. This is the first time on a show where we literally had a file cabinet that was just research. You know, usually you have tons of folders and binders. We had an entire file cabinet and I had what I called our art department Bible. So every set would have a picture of how it looked right now, a picture of if we were seeing it in the 60s, where it was in the 60s, and then if we were seeing it again in the 70s. And there's such a plethora of information out there that we were able to flip back and forth so we could address all those things. I mean, there was a guy who took pictures of the entire Sunset Strip over and over again. So you could see how it was in the 60s, then come back two years later, how it looked two years later. So it was sort of amazing because all you need to do was look for it and the information was there. And so was it possible to source a lot of, uh, a lot of materials uh, or did you still have to custom make a lot? Uh, you know, it's interesting my, that my favorite find that we found was there was this source for period wallpaper that was actually, it's just this woman who sells online. And a lot of the time she would have like six rolls or whatever. So I built set sizes. Like there is a bathroom I did that has very, it's like six foot seven, six foot five on this one, but we built it so that it would fit the wallpaper. Um, and I would say that was my most exciting find. Stuff like the furniture, because it's so beloved, there's a lot to, to find out there if you look for it. Um, when it comes down to like the really, you know, shag carpeting and that stuff, that gets a little harder. They, we did a lot of reproductions there. But there was even in Sound City, this great thing that we found when we were scouting where they had burlap over all these baffles on the walls. And on one scout, I had an art director pull back the burlap and the vintage fabric that you saw in a picture that we have of research with Stevie Nicks singing was hidden behind the burlap. So there were great things that you could find. And if not, it's so beloved, people know how to make it again.
Uh, well, uh, congratulations on your work on the show, uh, all the detail that you brought to it, uh, and of course the Emmy nomination that you or that you earned for it. So uh, thank you so much for talking to me about it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Judy Ree, you're nominated for an Emmy for production design for a narrative contemporary program, one hour or more, for your work on the mystery series Poker Face. Uh, now, the show's format takes its main character, uh, Charlie Kale, played by Natasha Leone, uh, to a new setting in almost every episode. Uh, how challenging is it to establish new locations for a show every single week? Well, um, that was the biggest challenge of the show. Uh, it was like making, you know, 10 different short films every 10 days. So early on, I knew that was going to be the biggest uh, hurdle for all of us. But thankfully, we had uh, most of the scripts and definitely an outline. So we knew kind of uh, the trajectory of Charlie Kale's character. Um, how difficult was it? It was very um Challenging, like I said, but thankfully I had such an amazing crew. Everyone rose to the occasion. Um, you know, everyone worked tirelessly to achieve the best version possible. And um, yeah, I think having most of the scripts in the outline was very helpful because we were able to kind of uh, prep some of it ahead of time or simultaneously as what we knew what was coming up. And we didn't shoot them in order. So we shot one nine and then um, went to three, four, and then, you know, so on. So it, um, the order of which it was to take place, you already had kind of a roadmap to follow. So um, that definitely helped. And the show feels very much like a, an old homage to classic uh, detective shows. Uh, did you draw inspiration from or reference uh, other shows like, you know, Columbo's and, and stuff like that in your designs? I don't know that I drew from those. It was more of an inspiration in that, um, you know, a lot of those shows I grew up with and watched as a kid and loved them. Uh, you know, Rockford Files, Columbo. Um, so when I had my initial conversation with Ryan, um, Ryan Johnson, who was the creator of the show, he mentioned that, but didn't necessarily say it had to look and feel like it. It was more about, uh, that's where his inspiration for the show and the writing came from. Um, you know, Charlie's journey really takes her off the beaten path. So for me, I did want it to feel timeless in that sense that when you go to sort of these smaller corners of the country, they haven't changed. So it was important for me to have it feel authentic to the specific scripts because she meets new characters and she's in a different geographical location that um, it felt timeless, but authentic to the characters and where she was, you know, whether it was Texas or New Mexico or upstate New York. Uh, and you're nominated specifically for the episode, The Orpheus Syndrome, uh, which is a mystery set in the world of Hollywood effects artists. Uh, what made you choose that, uh, you know, for consideration for, for this year's Emmys? You know, it was, a, it was a tough call. It came down to, for me, three or four. Um, and ultimately we chose that because, or I chose that because I felt like it contrasted the three different sort of uh, characters or the three different sets, main sets very differently. And we got to achieve a lot of fun sets with, you know, Arthur's Barn and LAM and Laura's Mansion, which all had a very different direction based on their characters. So, you know, Laura's Mansion is very austere and detached and um, Arthur's Barn is much warmer and, um, has sort of uh, supports his years of in the industry. So that was a lot of fun, which we started very early on. That was um, uh, an outline we had uh, with the, all the other scripts in the beginning. And so I knew that was gonna take the most amount of time to create, just to make it feel authentic and show the history of his, his career and his work, which had, a, you know, had to have a, a certain kind of variety of work. And then LAM itself, you know, was loosely inspired by um, ILM, which then had to reflect kind of their established history of what they did and Laura's connection to it. And I also knew that whatever it ended up being, it had to be special and unique and original. And that was yet another challenge for the episode, which was defined in the Hudson Valley, something that was originally written for Northern California. and. Um, so we were thrilled when we came across this um, 
abandoned IMP building. And, um, you know, after scouting for it for months in advance, we found that and I just thought this is perfect, you know, and I showed Ryan and he was thrilled. And so it all kind of came together in this sort of cohesive way visually to really support the story. Um, that's, yeah, that's really ultimately why I decided on that. Yeah, and uh, and that uh, barn, that workshop that uh, 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 that the Arthur character has is so there's so many details in that space. Just, you know, you're creating this character's entire basically history in that space. Uh, what were some of your favorite elements that you were able to incorporate into that into that design? You know, as I mentioned, we had to uh, start fabricating, renting, purchasing, borrowing all those <laughs> creatures, miniatures. Uh, robotics, uh, claymation models very early on. So we reached out to a lot of artists, fabricators, sculptors, uh, special effects makeup people, and we started to call for months. And um, during which time we try to keep a thread, um, we try to keep a thread of Arthur's character and really what would fit in his barn, even if they were different genres. So that was the most fun was, reaching out to all these artists and sculptors to see, you know, have studio visits and see what they had to offer. And then of course, our fabulous scenic department made a few of those as well, um, which they had a lot of fun doing because they had months to pre prepare those as well. Um, my favorite parts, I mean, it was just layering in his space, uh, you know, starting from a very, you know, if he had started his career in the 70s to take it through present day and everything in between and having the stain back and all the 16 millimeter film. And um, that was the most fun creating uh, Arthur's Barn. Uh, and, you know, this uh, is an episode uh, in part where, you know, some of the themes are talking about like, you know, the you know classic practical kind of effects versus modern CGI effects where those characters are currently situated in their careers. Uh, did it make you reflect at all on, on sort of how you work and like the difference between practical and, and when visual effects kind of contribute to, to a piece of work? Like how, how, did, how did you think about that? Well, early on, I think Ryan uh, Johnson and Natasha Leone, who uh, Natasha was one of the writers that's also the director they had had a conversation with Phil Tippett early on. So he was able to kind of contribute his part of it as well. And, you know, ob obviously um, Arthur's character is loosely based on Phil Tippett. So it's kind of started there. And then from that point on, you know, there was tons of research, thankfully, to look at Phil's career. And then also, you know, when I first started, it was very much, uh, you know, fabricating and uh, making with your hands before, you know, CGI and visual effects came into being. And, you know, we had uh, worked with 16 millimeter film when I was in film school. So I was familiar with the steam back and what a 16 millimeter film looked like and all of that. And it was interesting also to work with younger people who didn't know what that looked like or why it had certain sprockets where it did. And um, so that was a lot of fun, but, yeah, I mean, for Arthur's character, it's it's great to sort of go through the history of where he started in his career and where he is now or where we are now in our industry and everything in between. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, Natasha Leone is a co-writer on the episode and the director of the episode. Uh, what was it like working with her, uh, you know, sort of in all capacities, both, you know, her work in front of the camera as an actor and, of course, behind the scenes? Natasha was great. Um, I didn't really get to know her until episode eight because I was rarely on set. And so when we started prepping for that episode, we went on scouts together and I got to really know her. And I was so impressed how she was well aware of what everyone did and kind of the best way to achieve it. And mostly because she has worn many different hats as a producer, as a writer and a director, as well as in front of the camera. So she came incredibly prepared and was also very generous to uh, be collaborative and listen to your ideas. And really there was a trust there that was great. I mean, in a similar way that Ryan, um, he works with a lot of generosity as well to give you trust and leeway and have um, a lot of input. So yeah, working with Natasha was great. She was very incredibly professional and was 
very prepared and knew exactly what she wanted, was able to make decisions quickly. Um, you know, all those things that uh, designers love in a director. Uh, well, uh, congratulations on your work on the show in general um, and uh, on that episode in particular and on your uh, Emmy nomination. Uh, thank you so much for talking with me about it. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you. Mark Scruton, you're nominated for an Emmy for production design for a narrative contemporary program, one hour or more for your work on the series Wednesday. Uh, now, between the original comic and the Adams Family series from the 60s and the two movies in the 90s, like where do you even begin to take inspiration for the look of this particular series? Um, I think, well, I think that was the real trick um, when I first got the scripts and when I sat down and thought about how I was going to approach it. Um, I think I very consciously decided that I wasn't going to go back and rewatch the movies or rewatch the TV shows, even though they're both things I'd watched a lot as a kid or growing up and I knew them quite well in the back of my head. I didn't want to sit down and analyze what had made those shows work or not work or any of those elements. I kind of wanted to, to draw a line under all of that. And that was also the mandate from the showrunners that they wanted a fresh take on it and, and just sort of a, uh, a new world. To, to come out, not to sort of reference back into the into the other shows. So really, I sat down with the Shaz Adams cartoons and, and focused on them um, and went through all the books and, and looked at all the different illustrations that he'd done and, and this, tried to dig into the style that he was trying to create with those. And I did a lot of that before I went and had my first meeting with Tim. And when I spoke with Tim, he, that was kind of his thoughts as well, that he didn't want to sort of reference anything or, or research any of the original shows or any of the original um, films and, and really go right back to the source material and that was our focus um, I think which which is pretty much what we held true to I think I don't other than a few um, easter eggs that we peppered in here and there referencing the tv show I think we kind of stayed true to the original illustrations rather than the other stuff as you mentioned, uh, you know, you're working with Tim Burton uh, on this show. Uh, he's a producer and directed the first four episodes. Um, you have worked with him before on, on Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Um, you know, how is it different working with him on, on a series, you know, where, you know, there's so much more, like a, a, a broader scope usually? Yeah, it was interesting because I'd all directed with him before on Miss Peregrine. So, designing was a whole different sort of ball game for me um and i wasn't sure how it was going to work and certainly on a tv show which he hadn't really done before either so what i was surprised at is when we met together that was very much the right how are we going to do this attitude not you know listen to what i say and do what i do it was very much a collaborative from the get-go about how we're going to make this show work because it had to work on so many levels and not just logistically but everything else as well i think the whole show was a challenge so we both went into it um you know sort of dependent on each other to try and make it work because i had more experience in tv than he did so there was a little bit of give and take on that front but um but it was you know it was great to sit down with tim and actually sort of try and get his ideas out of his head because there's the whole thing was mapped out already in there and it was it's you know he's one of those directors you have to sort of tease it out bit by bit um but you know he's he's so wonderfully visual that you know however you get there you're going to get to the right place and it, you have to go on a meandering journey to get to it but it's, it's, it's always a fun journey <laughs> and the, the opportunity to sit down and do something episodical meant you could really explore those ideas and dig into them rather than have to sort of skip across them like you sometimes do in movies uh, you're specifically nominated for the premiere episode wednesday's child is full of woe uh, which of course lays the groundwork for the rest of the series uh, now, what's interesting is that the series has this really dark and gothic tone, but it's also very funny. It's a, it's comedic. Uh, how do you how do you balance those things visually? Well, I think that's very interesting. I we always tried to not deliberately try and make anything funny. Um, I think it, it, we didn't want to build in gags or anything that was overtly sort of ridiculous but but by the nature of what we're doing it sort of did that anyway <laughs> so i think the, the the trick was always not to try too hard with these things and to, to design what was needed and and what would look right without trying to over over egg any of those elements and you know when something needed to be dark it was dark and when something needed to be 
lighter we would tend to dig into that a little bit more with with the dressing and the elements but it was always we were always trying to be true to the to the world we we're creating rather than trying to make it a sort of slapstick element or a comedy element or or anything else i think and and the comedy came from the writing and the, the performances and, and and thing nine times out of ten added to those things it was always a design wise that was always the biggest trick because very close to when we were shooting it became clear that thing was not going to be a cg character who was going to be a real and on set 90 percent of the time with a real person attached to it so we hadn't really designed sets to accommodate a hidden person through all the episodes um so very quickly we had to adapt lots of sets and rework lots of elements and rebuild lots of furniture to accommodate the actor playing thing and, and get him into those sets which was a bit of a challenge right at the last minute um and you know nevermore academy which is where uh, a lot of the series is set there are a lot of dark tones um uh you know inherent in in the design for that um what are uh you know some of the opportunities and challenges involved when when you're working with kind of a darker color palette well i think the main thing we always wanted to do with it was was never make anything black nothing was ever sort of black out of a can as i would say because everything was always a version you know a tone of something um and that was most prevalent in in wednesday's side of her dormitory where you know it was very sparsely dressed very minimal and everything was very specific and all the props were very specific um and then everything we got we then would take it into the paint shop with our with our excellent prop painters and we would strip it back pare it down and then start dyeing it or varnishing it or or um applying finishes to it which would keep the inherent character to those elements but then darken it down and desaturate it until it got to a point where it was just the right tone to fit into the palette of the noir we were trying to create but it, it still had the character to it um and you still had the age and the history and the patina that was was inherent to it. um so, so nothing in Nevermore was ever black and it always had character to it, but it always normally reflected the character that was important to it. So Wednesday, we were always trying to make everything look very dark and black and white and everything else. But then the Weems office, it was much more plums and reds and purples and, and sort of more vibrant tones, but still, you know, dark and moody. Um, so it was always about, you would dye things sort of ingredients. So you, you, keep going until you went right that's that's the time to stop um always trying to keep a sense of history and, and a sense of character to each individual piece i think um and you know at nevermore academy you've got these striped uniforms with the shade of blue that really pops against uh the surroundings uh how in general did you work with uh the costume designer colleen atwood and and sort of create that cohesive look that that really stands out well, I think, I think what was great about this show is it, it it was very good at giving you steers. Alan Miles had written these great scripts that were were very descriptive and very um, uh, evocative of the world we were trying to create. So Colleen and I had a really good starting point, a really good language was already there when we first started talking. You know, we knew what we had to do with Enid, we knew what we had to do with Wednesday. Um, and we were actually doing a lot of it long distance because we were still making this during COVID um she was in LA I was in London we were going to shoot the whole thing in Romania um so there's lots of you know zoom calls and and emails that miss each other in the night for the time changes and everything else um but at the end we had this very good roadmap which helped us enormously to to get the look right um and quite often we wouldn't have the, the costumes and the sets in the same place until we shot on them um so there's lots of you know cross fingers and held breath um, but nine times out of 10, it hit the mark. And if it didn't, it was, you know, we had to tweak it or make it work. But I think everything slotted together very easily, actually, in the end. Uh, and then you got the town of Jericho, which is uh, such a strong visual contrast uh, compared to, to Nevermore. Uh, how did you go about creating that town and, and you know, making decisions about, you know, use of color and, and, and style there? I mean, Jericho was sort of the massive challenge from my point of view anyway because we were going to shoot it in toronto and we we're going to go to a real location for that town it was going to be fine and we were going to you know a bit of set dressing and everything else um and then we moved the whole show to bucharest quite late in the day 
which had no American towns of any kind. Um, so it became quite evident that we had to build it from the ground up. Um, so we found this sort of piece of wasteland outside of the studio complex um, and sat down and we drew it very quickly and, and started building it almost immediately. Um, but what it gave us was this great opportunity to create the world completely. So we knew we had to create Nevermore, that was always a thing. But the opportunity to create both worlds was was something that was sort of unprecedented for me because you could you could hone everything. So the idea that we wanted to put into place was the fact that Jericho was this very sort of um, slightly over stylized, perfect New England town and was very bright and poppy and Evermore was very dark and brooding. You had this, the opposites in the same way you had the opposites in Wednesday's dormitory and, and Enid, you know, Enid's side and Wednesday's side. And we wanted to create the whole world of opposites. And then building Jericho, we could really dig into that and make sure that everything was a color, nothing was black. Everything had this slightly oversaturated color scheme and the, you know everything was up and slightly too pristine and slightly too immaculate and always keeping things slightly on the sinister side of, of you know, um, that world. Um, and it was great, but it, it was a huge town. Everything was built composite um, because we were there for multiple episodes. We didn't want to have to top it up every time with CG. So what you see in camera is pretty much what we built, um, which was a, a lot to do in the 16 weeks we had to do it in. Um, but you really could walk around, go in the shops, go into the coffee shop. You know, everything was designed to the script. So you could have uh, Wednesday sliding down the uh, drain pipe and running across the square and running into the coffee shop, all in camera, all coming out of the bathroom window. It was, it was a really fun thing to be able to do from scratch. Well, uh, I want to congratulate you on your work on the show uh, and on your Emmy nomination for it. Uh, thank you so much for talking with me about it today. Thanks so much. Shane Fox, uh, you're nominated for an Emmy for production design for a narrative program, Half Hour, for your work on What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, now, this is your second Emmy nomination for the show, but your first as a production designer. Uh, previously, you were nominated uh, for the show as a set decorator. Uh, so does this recognition mean something different this time around? Yes, it's totally hit different. It feels, uh, you know, to be the production designer and to get the that um nomination recognition it, it just feels different it's more cool <laughs> uh and you're nominated for the episode the night market uh where the characters visit the title and marketplace uh you know that serves supernatural creatures uh it, it's it's su such a vast space the, you know the way it appears on screen uh like how long did it take to create that overall would you say Hmm. Um, the actual install, once we knew what we were doing and how to plan and had agreed on all the elements, it took over a month uh, for our little show, our 20 minute, 22 minute little show. It, that's a long time for us. Um, once we yeah came to the decision of how we're going to approach it, I think the set decoration team had something like 18 50 foot trailers full of set decoration just a lot of stuff. So it just took them days and days and days just to unload the trailers and to lay everything out and we could see what needed to go to paint, what needed to be modified, how we were gonna rig it all. Um, it was also tricky figuring out the subway car bit. We actually brought in, uh, I think it was like two cars of a subway train into our location there and had to work out how to build a platform for it and how to move it, it was just not very straightforward. You get a sense of the scope of the space when you see it. the subway car actually looks kind of small in there. So it, it's just a funny element. Um, but yeah, we, we, we sort of, um, my approach to that set was to build a skeletal system that all these booths could be built upon or built from instead of choosing to design each setup, each section, each booth of the night market, we, we built a, a skeletal structure of uprights and cross pieces and bases and flame bowls. And we built these cocoon lanterns and they all kind of interconnected and everything was sort of to work together to build the structure so we could have, you know, go 16 feet high and so everything wasn't really low because the ceiling in there was, I don't know, a couple hundred feet high at least. Um, so that was that. Yeah, it took a while and to get all the lighting and everything, all the rigging and making sure all the stunts were set up and everything was safe. So for us, that was one of our biggest time consuming 
most hands on deck, most truckloads of stuff set up that the show has really ever done. Uh, and, and where did you construct the night market? Because uh, obviously, as you mentioned, you need all the space and creating this, this scope. So there is this derelict uh, large building um, in Toronto on the east side here um, that, you know, it's a big old warehouse. It was once some sort of hydro something. I'm not exactly sure what its real history is. But it's just an immense space and it's very cool and it offers a lot of texture and, you know, there's already uh, an, a, a vibe in there that we just ran with and built upon. Uh, now, the whole location looks pretty seamless. Uh, is, you know, is it mostly, you know, practical builds or were visual effects incorporated to like extend the, the builds or, or enhance anything? For the most part, it's practical. I think um, there was a tiny bit of visual effects to help with the stunts to just hide all our sins. You know, when he cra when Guillermo crashes into the foreman's trailer that I put there, you know, it didn't have a, a ceiling, but there's a shot from above looking down and they just put a CGI ceiling in because we didn't want to see our crash mats in our boxes that he was actually hitting or that, that they fell into. <clears throat> we built walls and we built a lot of like elements of the fun stuff for set dressing to be on, but we brought in cars and like I say, the subway, I don't know if it read as if it was real in the, in the episode, like the subway car was real, but it was. Um, so yeah, a lot of large objects went into this really large space and not much fixing in post. Um, and there's so much happening in that night market uh, for, you know, one half hour episode. Uh, were, there were there elements that you liked that you couldn't accommodate or things that had to be cut for time or, you know, just, just stuff that, you know, you just couldn't, you just couldn't fit? There was a lot in there. Like, as you say, we, every corner, you know, the way we shoot the show, the mockumentary style is the camera sees 360. We see everything. I never know sometimes what parts of a set are going to be featured more when the director gets in there and starts blocking things but so we went to town in that space and you know I made sure that there were really cool elements and things everywhere and I remember walking through with Yana our director Yana Goriskaya um and just showing her all the things like make sure you capture this oh and over here you got this and I know you've got to make the scene make sense but like you gotta shoot this corner because this is just so amazing so there was a lot that the camera didn't see a lot of details but that's just the nature of what we do you know yeah and uh in, in general like how, how much do you use like previous sets or builds to kind of, you know, create new locations for the show? And, you know, are you, are you repurposing a lot uh, for, you know, in general? We try not to, you know, cause we don't want to repeat things and we don't want, we want to keep it visually interesting and surprising and fun for the audience. So sometimes we'll recycle something if it's just like simple thing that can be repainted and repurposed. But for the most part, we try and stay away from that, you know, by being mindful. Yeah, of course, if we if there's flats that we can use and just paint them and they're good to go, but nothing that's like striking and dynamic. We always want to keep reinventing and and have it be interesting. Um, and, you know, have, have you brought in any elements from the night market or stuff that you prepared for that or, you know, and didn't use or stuff that's in there tucked away in corners. Have any of it like popped up since then uh, in, in the other aspects of the show? We don't throw anything away. We have a huge warehouse of stuff. So yes, sometimes we'll repurpose, you know, a coffin or repaint a chair. Uh, and there's a, a lot of the night market stuff is stuck in trailers. Like we're holding on to it. I don't know why um, for future use, maybe. But not so much, not yet. <laughs> it's all standing by though, at the ready. W would you like to see like another episode potentially visit the night market, uh, you know, just to be able to show more of it and imagine more of it? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it would feel like maybe taking a step back, you know, it's not, wouldn't be as exciting the second time. Uh, <clears throat> it would be fun, but let's see what the writers come up with. 
Uh, there's so much going on in that uh, in that market. Uh, what were some of the like the details or elements that maybe people might not pick up on right away? Uh, you know that that you were especially proud of that you know just you know you thought were especially funny or creative or you know exciting to to create. Well, when when we were coming up with what these booths were and all the separate sections, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that there was a lot of interesting details and textures and things that maybe you don't necessarily see. Like we had a bookseller in there and we built this 14 foot tall um, bookcase and I wanted the books to be stacked on the shelves, but to create an image. So there was like a the image of a skull just based on the colors of a, the book spines, you know? So from a distance, it would look like a skull. When you get up close, you realize, oh, it's just a 14 foot tall bookcase. I think we caught that in the episode, but you may not have like clicked on it or registered. Uh, I mean, there was, we had a, where Gamro and Nandor have like a sword fight. There was, we had a blacksmith, blacksmith set up and that was really fun to design. Like, the elements of a blacksmith station and how to make it look like you had a little crucible going with like the coals and the heat and there's just many many instances like that where we just dove into the details and hope that the camera would be close enough to get it uh, well uh congratulations on your work on the show uh on uh your second emmy nomination for it uh, and uh thank you so much for talking to me about it thank you so much it was a pleasure Welcome to our Meet the Experts Emmy-nominated TV production designers panel. I'm here with Sam Lysenko from The Bear, Jessica Kender from Daisy Jones and the Six, Judy Ree from Poker Face, Mark Scruton from Wednesday, and Shane Fox from What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, now, first off, congratulations to all of you on your nominations. Um, you know, as we're recording this, the industry is very uh, uh, uncertain at the moment, but uh, in general, when it comes to like receiving recognition from your peers is that something you feel opens doors or that you hope will open doors you know to even more opportunities to come uh you know knock on wood when those opportunities come back uh let's start with uh sam um i i've i hope <laughs> um i think that uh especially with creative craft the right next choices for your life will present themselves. And as long as you're confident in the kinds of choices you're making along the way, those those will reveal themselves to be new opportunities. So if nothing else, it's great to get a chance to um, resolidify re my connection to an industry. Because sometimes I think, especially as a as designer, I don't know about everybody else, but I feel sort of removed. Like designers don't hang out with other designers um, to a certain extent. So like, it's it's just nice to know that there's other people who are also in their little boats out there doing doing the same sort of thing, you know. Judy. Well, I first of all, I think it's such an honor to be included and to be nominated. But in terms of it leading to other work, yes, you know, as Sam said, that would be great. I don't know that that is necessarily how it'll play out, but it is nice to meet other designers, as Sam also mentioned. And hopefully it will widen the, you know, the scope of who recognizes you and your name and your work. So, yeah, it's, it's all good to sort of bring it all forward to other people that maybe you may not have met or have encountered. Yeah, it's great. I mean, being recognized by your peers and, you know, having a show be popular with the fans. That's also really great that everybody's work gets celebrated when one of us get accolades I find you know like it's just a testament to every single person who works on the show because it takes so many people it's not just you know us as the heads of the art department it's it's great for everybody I think yeah I think you're right what you were saying about everybody it's a it's a group award in the end isn't it we, we I'm sitting here but in the end the show was a huge reflection on you know probably 200 people that worked on it and I think that's I was always twitchy about getting nominated for these sort of awards because the pressure suddenly becomes huge on you as a person. I, you know, I, I sort of dipped my toe in the award season a few years ago, and it was quite a high pressure thing, and you're always quite nervous about that. But I think the the um, the the rewards it gives to the crew, and certainly the crew on this show, which who worked incredibly hard and and weren't well known crew, I think is immense. And actually, when I speak to them now, they're all so proud of the fact that we've got this far with the show. And the you know the the reception it's had is it makes it actually you know a very valid thing. It's, it's a great thing to be part of. Well, I mean, I think 
obviously like you, you hope it gets you the even better, bigger job, which when you get a job and you're nominated like this, you're like, how can it get better? You know, but I feel like we all do this because we want people to see our work and getting nominated. Number one says it's very likely a lot of people are seeing your work. You know, I, I am in TV because I always love that. Like my grandma who couldn't drive could just turn on and see my work. And this lets you know that people are are out there enjoying the thing that you love. And that's super exciting. Um, and, you know, thinking about, you know, your careers uh, uh, and, and, and the work you would love to do uh, moving forward, like, is there like a dream project that you'd love to work on that, you know, if you could wave a magic wand and make it happen, whether it's a genre or uh, a time period or, or, or something like that, uh, is there a world that you'd like to inhabit? Uh, we can start with uh, Shane. Good question. <laughs> I think, yeah, there's dream projects, but I also, I'm just waiting for the phone call and to be whisked away to like Prague or something and do some really cool medieval or just some period piece and, you know, get to go to like old cemeteries and I don't know, I'm wait waiting for that phone call. That would be the dream. There's, you know, there's different, different levels, you know, sometimes I just want to do the big budget period pieces. And then sometimes I think about pushing myself to do you know stuff that I've never really touched upon I don't know but yeah Prague I want to go to Prague if I if I say it will that help manifest it anybody listening <laughs> well we hopefully have people in the industry watching this uh so uh you know keep 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 your you know you know your, your phone on and you, you might you might get that call awesome <laughs> uh Jessica how about you well I gotta say I would love like a west world i love me some sci-fi i've already now i can check off the 70s which were on my bucket list before but some some sci-fi giant thing where i get to create the future and i would also say anything written by liz tigelar or produced by lauren neustadler i'm in but if they did a west world that would be my dream job right there tied up in a bow i can die happy mark um, it's, that's a really hard question, isn't it? I think, you know, the, the, there's so many genres I think I wanted to work in now, which I think I've either experienced or I've already done. And it, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. I kind of, I do like the spinning wheel of sort of destiny where you never know what's going to come at you next. And that element I think is the best part of what we do that you never know what you're going to get given. And you've suddenly got to learn a whole new, you know, world or a whole new element of history that you had no idea about. Um, but I think, you know, if you if you press me on what, you know, my dream project, I think anything involving David Lynch would be, <laughs> would be hugely on my bucket list. Um, whatever it was, whatever he was making, whether it's period, science fiction, anything. Um, but yeah, I think I think the uh, the unknown is normally the best thing for me, to be honest. Judy. Yeah, I think for me, it's more about the people that I work with. So, um, you know, there's a handful of directors and producers I would love to work with again and continue to. Um, I think the rapport that you create on certain projects and the success of the show or the film ends up being the relationship that you have with the directors or the writers or the showrunners. Um, and then secondly, for me, it's about the script. If I connect to the script, it uh, doesn't matter what the genre is or the character or whatever the setting happens to be. I tend to do my better work or my best work, um, but I do have to connect to the script. So it's less about genre for me than the quality of the writing and the people that I work with. Those are at the top of my list. I I, I was just going to say I'm I'm prepping a, a Westworld style medieval sci-fi epic in Prague right now. So Rude. I'm good. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, for me, it's it, the process of, of learning um, is the most exciting thing. It, to me, it's much more exciting than actually making stuff. Um, and so uh, as long as there's variance, I couldn't predict what the dream job would be because it's going to be so different than anything I've done previously. You know, this week it's English tapestry. Next week it's the history of telephones in Mexico, whatever it winds up being for me, it is the enticing part of it. So I, I think it's the variance and, and, and the potential for, for myself to grow. 
Yeah, that's that's the best thing with all these jobs, isn't it? It's it's finding out, you know, learning something you didn't know about two minutes yeah. before the phone went. Um, I mean, I spent all summer learning about the Peasants' Revolt and the film didn't happen, but I had a great summer learning about it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But James mm. Bond, James Bond. We all want James Bond. That's <laughs> That would be great. We had to say it out loud, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being in, in, in production design, I'm wondering if there are other fields uh, of the industry, like if you hadn't gotten into production design, uh, or, or, or art departments, like what area in, in film and TV and production would, would you have been interested in uh, uh, were it not for, for this one, uh, if, if there is one? Uh, uh, Judy, how about you? Well, I guess if I had to pick, it would, it would be writing because that's where it all starts. And um, the idea that you can uh, create something from nothing and dictate the character's trajectory or the setting that it happens to be in, all those things I think um, are very interesting and exciting. So I think that's where it would be. Uh, Sam? Craft service, most likely. <laughs> um, no, I, I, my, my path to design was always, um, was always, one of the movies getting bigger and and me and my friends having a little more creative ability with each one so on the on the very early end production design and producing is the same thing because it's like oh we need this tomorrow location or we need to fabricate this prop or pick up the actors from school whatever it winds up being so i i think that the skill set would probably align itself for me to deal with some element of production because uh, i think it's a the wiring is similar I, I don't think i would enjoy it nearly as much though Jessica? Okay, this might be the cheesy answer, but I can't imagine doing anything else. I went to school at a conservatory where I only learned set design. So literally these are my only skills. So you send me out there and tell me I can't do this. I, I would be lost. Like this is exactly what I had hoped to be doing. And it's exactly what I hope to continue until I retire. And then, you know, just road trip the world. <laughs> Mark? It's interesting. I think Sam's probably right that the, the closest kit thing akin to designing is actually producing, which is a strange thing because it seem to be the two sort of most opposed views. I think, I mean, you know, originally I wanted to direct, but I think the, the directing position is, unless you're on a tour these days, it's, it's a very different animal to what I thought it was when I went to film school. Um, so I, I think producing is probably the, the, the most akin to what we do, but I, I couldn't be anything other design to be honest i think i'd get so frustrated not being able to create stuff and build stuff and be in charge of that element i think in the end it would have to be designing all the time and shane i think yeah i agree with that production design is akin to producing except in producing there's too many spreadsheets and budget meetings with accountants and i just that doesn't appeal to me at all i think I would probably go back to my roots a bit. I mean, I started when I started in film when I was 17, I was building foam and fleece puppets like with um, people who work with Jim Henson and went into prop building. And then I was the breakaway glass girl for a while and like very hands on. That's me. That's my approach. So I'd probably go back to that world and build things you know, just go back to the real world where there's glues everywhere and staple guns and like, you know, crazy shops and you get the request for the bonkers 12 foot high pumpkin and you just try and figure out how to make it. And, you know, that's sort of my approach to production design anyway. I'm very crafty and makey. And so I'd probably go back to that because I think anything else would be too, like I say, spreadsheets and meetings with accountants which is like soul sucking right so <laughs> that would be it for me uh, well i, I want to congratulate you all again on your work on your respective projects uh how, how different they are and and uh but of course how similar they are and all being nominated for an emmy this year uh so uh, uh thank you so much for talking to me about it it's been a pleasure thank you thank you, thank you.